Simulating data is a very powerful way to test your understanding of statistical concepts. We're going to use simulations to learn the basics of probability. Let's start out with univariate distributions. We need to know a little bit about how different variables might be distributed before we know how to simulate those. So the uniform distribution is probably the simplest distribution. All the numbers in a range have an equal probability of being sampled. We use the function runif to sample values from a uniform distribution. The argument n tells us how many values do we want to sample. Let's start with 10. And then we sample those values from a range that has a minimum and maximum. The minimum is by default 0, but you can change that. Let's set it to 10 here. And the maximum by default is 1, but we'll set it to 20. So we can generate 10 values from this uniform distribution. It's a continuous distribution, so you'll get fractional values. If we run this again, you'll get a different 10 values. Now, whenever we simulate data, we want to be able to plot it um, to see, does the data look like what we expect it to? We can use the hist function to really quickly plot some data, um, just for this simple purpose. So set your 10 values to the variable u and just run a histogram on u. We run this chunk. We can see they're not perfectly uniformly distributed, but if we increase the number of values we sample to 100, we can see there's more of an equal chance for any number to be chosen. If we increase that to 1,000, even more. If we want to run very large ends, we can use this notation. 1e6. So this is a 1 followed by 6 zeros. And we can see there when we have a very large sample, numbers in each of these bins are approximately equally likely to be sampled. So this is what a uniform distribution looks like. Now in psychological data, it's pretty rare to have a uniformly distributed continuous variable, um, but we have discrete variables that are uniformly distributed often. Um, let's say, classic example, rolling a six-sided die. We need to use a different function to sample values from a discrete distribution. It's called sample. The first thing that goes into the sample argument is the list of values. So here we can just use one colon six to represent the six sides of a six-sided die. And then the next argument is size. So how many times are we going to roll that die? Um, so let's just roll it once. See, here we rolled a one or a two, a one again. Um, let's try to roll it 10 times. We'll get an error here, and this is because the sample function doesn't replace values by default. In fact, if you don't tell it what size you want, it will return all six values all of your values in a random order. So this can be a really nice way to generate randomized orders for, say, a counterbalance experiment. Um, so by default, sample will remove items from the population and not replace them. If you want to replace them, let's say we want to roll a die independently 10 times, we need to replace all the numbers every time. So we always start with equal probability of 1 through 6. So we set replace to true, and now we can have repeats. Now you can also use sample to sample from a list of named outcomes. Let's say we have pet types of a few different types of pets. So we create a vector called pet types with cat, dog, and ferret, say. Now we can sample from pet types, and let's assign you a random pet. So we'll just sample one pet. So you get a dog, maybe a ferret, but ferrets are quite a lot less common than cats and dogs. So we can also set the probability that you get each pet type different from equal or uniform probability. So we can make another variable called pet prob and create that as a vector of how likely are you to 
um, own a cat or a dog or a ferret. Let's say 40% of people have cats, 50% um, of people have dogs, and only 10% have ferrets. Okay. Now if we sample a few more of these, maybe 20 from here, and we set prob equal to pet prob, Oops, I have that same problem again. I'm trying to sample more items than there are in the list. Replace equals true. And here we can see that ferret is relatively less common than cat or dog. And again, a quick way to sample this, we can use ggplot here. If you don't have a data frame, you can just put ggplot with no arguments and add on an individual geom. So here we'll be using GM bar, and we can put the aesthetic mapping inside of GM bar. So we can set P to the sampled value. That's our, our vector of sampled pets. And then have a look at our, um, our graph. So if we chose more than 20, say a sample of 200 pets, um, we would then see that yes, our distribution is about 40% cats, 50% dogs, 10% ferrets. Another kind of distribution is the binomial distribution. Um, you'll often learn about this as the coin flip distribution. Now this is great for modeling binary data where each observation can have just one of two outcomes like success or failure, yes or no, heads or tails. Um, so let's model some coin flips. We use the rbinome function to pull values from a binomial distribution. Um, n is the number of observations. So let's flip a coin 10 times. Size is the number of trials. So how many coins are we going to flip? Let's just flip one. And we need to set the probability. It's a fair coin, so it's a 0.5 probability that this coin will land on heads. Now if we run that, you can see here we get a vector of 10, 0, or 1 values. So we get tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads. And we can flip the coin again another 10 times. You can switch n in size, and it represents basically the same thing in two different ways. We can just one time observe 10 different coins flipping, basically, and it will give you the total. So it's just the sum of all those numbers that you got before. But then you can do that multiple times. So flip a set of 10 coins 10 separate times, and here are the number of times that the coins came up heads in each of the separate flips of 10. This is really useful if you have, say, Scores on a task where participants are um, can be correct or incorrect. So let's say we create a score from 100 participants and they're doing um, 20 trials on a task. And they're pretty good at this task, so they've got a 0.8 probability of being correct. So we can generate all these scores that your participants might have had. And again, we might want to plot these. A histogram is probably the best way to plot binomial data. So we set the histogram, and the x-axis will represent score. Um, with a histogram, you always want to set bin width. We'll set it to 1 here, and the outline color to white, just so we can see it a little bit nicer. So here's our binomial distribution. The nice thing about this is that it gives you um, integers, if that's what your, your scores are. So you could model um, a large number. So if you had, say, 200 trials per, per participant, you could model this. Um, and let's say you have a very large number of participants. This is about the same as what would happen if you were modeling um, a normal distribution with a mean of 160 and the appropriate standard deviation will give you the same if you round all the values to the nearest integer. 
Um, but the binomial distribution is only the same as the normal distribution at very high numbers, really only at infinity. But with smaller numbers, the binomial distribution is very different from the normal distribution, and you should be choosing the one that has the appropriate um, mechanism that your data are generated by. So the normal distribution is probably the one that you're most familiar with, and we've used the R-norm function before. Um, it's a nice, quick function. The first argument is always n, the number of observations we want. So let's pull 10 again. And then we characterize our normal distribution with the mean. So let's set a mean of 100 and the standard deviation. We'll set it to 10, although they default to 0 and 1. So we can get 10 values here, maybe another 10 values. Because this is a continuous distribution, it's best to apply it with the GM density function. So let's set these values to x. And let's set this to a, a somewhat larger number here. Okay, now we've got an approximately normal distribution. One nice trick is if you want to compare your values to an exactly normal distribution, you can use the stat function function in um, ggplot. So stat function takes um, two important arguments. So what is the statistical function you want to represent? And dnorm is that function. Um, what are the arguments that you want to give to that function? So we make a list and we need to give them names. So we want the mean t equal 100, sd equals 10. And we're also going to add one more argument here. Color is red, so that um, our line is a different color than the sampled data. If we run that, we can see our um, exact normal distribution is really, really close to our sampled one. But let's say we only sampled um, 50 participants. And now we can see that the, um, the sample distribution, the gray one, is quite different from the exact normal distribution because you get this at smaller samples. And if you take even smaller samples, you can see even larger differences on every individual trial. The final distribution that we'll talk about is the Poisson distribution. Now this is good for modeling um, events, especially rare events, but let's model a not so rare event number of texts I get per day. So you might be able to guess our POIS is the function for generating values from a random Poisson distribution. Um, n is how many values do we want to generate. Um, so let's model an entire year of my life. So 365 days. And the second argument to our POIS is lambda. This is basically the, the average um, Incidents. So on average, how many texts do I get per day? Let's say on average I get 80 texts per day. So we can look at that and it will give you integer values. They can't be lower than zero. Um, the mean of them will be 80, but they won't be normally or symmetrically distributed unless your n and lambda are very, very high. All right, so we can pop up here and just use that same code, we want to plot these with a histogram, um, but we'll plot text, not score. Okay, so we can see this looks approximately, but not exactly normal. When lambda is much lower, let's say it's a more um, rare incident. I'm not very popular, and on average, I get two texts a day. Um, then we can see that there's many days when I get zero. Actually, the most frequent number is one. But the average is two because there's some days where I get five or six texts. Um, if I had a very large number, like 200 a day, and we want to look at that over 10 years, again, we approximate a normal distribution. Um, but I want you to be thinking of the process that's generating your data and use um, a distribution simulation function that reflects that process.